Okay, so hi everyone to the one more CERN container webinar. Today we have uh, Thomas Hartland from the CERN from CERN IT talking about what's new in Kubernetes uh, 119 and um, some of the cool features that come, but uh, also specifically the added support for auto scaling of node groups in the in our setup at CERN. So I'll just pass to him the questions. Feel free to use the Q&A box or just uh, write in the chat and we can take them as we go or, or, as, or in the end as you, as you wish. So Thomas, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, thanks for joining today. I'm Thomas Hartland and uh, this is uh, what's new in Kubernetes version 1.19. So 1.19 uh, was first released uh, about a month ago, there have been two bug fix releases since then, just uh, just small bugs, nothing major, and uh, our cluster template for Kubernetes 1.19 will be released uh, soon. Um, I, uh, we scheduled this webinar a while ago, so I was hoping that we'd have a template released uh, before this, but uh, unfortunately we don't, we have uh, still making some some patches in in magnum to be able to fully support kubernetes uh, 1.19 as for what's new uh there's a, a whole page full of release notes you can skim through here if you have the time it does highlight some of the the major changes there and compared to the 1.18 release notes there are more uh, major changes but a lot of them are kind of behind the scenes things or uh, only applicable to, to other clouds. So for us, the, the list is uh, fairly small. So this should be, uh, it shouldn't take uh, too long to go through. And uh, for us, the biggest changes are the, the cluster autoscaler, which now supports uh, Magnum node groups and uh, node group auto discovery, which makes things uh, a lot easier for, for autoscaling and uh, the updated version of the, the autoscaler is mentioned in the release notes from the, the previous slide, but the, the full release notes are in the, the autoscaler releases. And uh, also in 1.19, the cube scheduler can be configured to have multiple scheduling policies defined that you can use uh, on a per deployment basis. And this works very well with the, the cluster autoscaler because scheduling policies uh, quite heavily affect the, the efficiency of, of auto scaling, especially for scaling down. So we'll come back to scheduling in a couple of minutes and uh, let's look at uh, auto scaling for now. So with 1.19, uh, creating a cluster for, for auto scaling will be pretty much just the same as it, as it already is, except you'll use a Kubernetes 1.19 template, which will look something like this. Uh, and then you uh, get this merger labels and uh, the additional label auto scaling enabled is true and uh, a name for your cluster. So that's the same as it is now, uh, except it will be when the cluster is deployed, it will have uh, support for, for node groups and a node group auto discovery will be configured for, for the default node group. But there is one extra step, which is that you need to set a maximum size for the, the default worker node group if you want to auto scale that. So you do that with uh, an OpenStack COE node group update command, which is takes a cluster name, the node group name, and then you replace the max node count. Uh, so this would set it to, to five nodes in this node group. And unfortunately, uh, this isn't possible to set in the, the cluster create command. So you, you need to do this extra command for that. And if you want to scale something that is not the default node group, then you can create an extra node group for that, uh, where you can give the, the maximum number of nodes on, on creation of the node group. And then you can set it to, to roll auto scaling, and that will be picked up by the, by the auto scaler and it will scale this node group for you. Uh, and if you want to scale any other roles, say if you uh, want to have a separate role for, for GPU nodes or something like that, and you want to auto scale those, uh, you can do that by editing the, the cluster auto scaler deployment in the kube system namespace. And so you would look for this line where it says uh, node group auto discovery, 
and then it gives a, a list of roles. So this would be the, the default worker, which is there by default, auto scaling, which is there by default, and then you can add any other role to this list that you want. Uh, and that is kind of uh, it, apart from the fact that uh, you also need to set the, the maximum node count for, for each node group that you want to be auto scaled. So this is the same command as earlier where you set the, the maximum node count. And if for any reason you want to disable auto scaling for a group either permanently or, or just temporarily, you can remove that uh, maximum node count with a command like this, where you remove the max node count because you, you can't change the, the role of the node group after it's been created. So the cluster auto scaler will always see it as that role, but if it doesn't have a, a maximum node count then the cluster auto scaler can't do anything for it and it will just ignore the group. Uh, so that's it. That's a quick uh, overview of cluster auto scaling again. Uh, if you want to, you can go back and, and watch the, the last webinar that I did that went uh, further in depth on cluster auto scaling. Uh, but now let's take a look at uh, scheduling. So in uh, 1.19, as I said, you can have multiple scheduling policies defined in a cluster. And that means that we can define extra policies by default that you don't have to use, but are there and available for you if you want to use them. And so to make the best use of this with the cluster autoscaler, we can define a bin packing policy that will use the smallest number of nodes possible for a, a given deployment. And so to do that, you set the, the scheduler name in the, the pod spec. So if you make a deployment, then you have the, the deployment spec, the template and the, the pod spec. And here you set the, the scheduler name. So this scheduler name is what well, previously you would use it if you had multiple instances of the scheduler running in a cluster. Now you can do it with uh, one cluster, uh, sorry, one instance of a, a scheduler, but that has multiple policies defined. So this would use a, a bin packing scheduler for the, the pods, but only the pods of this deployment. And as for where this name bin packing scheduler comes from, that's a, a configuration on the, the master node. So it's, this is what it is. Um, it looks a lot like a, kind of a Kubernetes resource definition. It's got this API version, uh, a kind, but this is not uh, something that is created in Kubernetes, like a, a, like a deployment or a pod resource. This is just the format of a, a file that exists on the, the master node and which is passed as an argument to the, the kube scheduler. And so what this does is it defines multiple profiles. Uh, so here's the scheduler name default scheduler. Uh, this one has to exist because this is what is used if you don't specify a scheduler name in the, the pod spec. And because this has uh, no extra arguments, it just kind of inherits all of the, the default options. And then we also will define a bin packing scheduler. So this has uh, some extra configuration. So it's in this plugins, uh, the score is, uh, it's one of the stages in, in scheduling. So it's after nodes have been filtered for, for which ones are possible to, to put a, a pod on. And then each node gets a, a score. So in, in this scoring algorithm, we, we disable the node resources least allocated plugin, and we enable node resources most allocated with some, some high weight so that uh, this will be the kind of uh, deciding factor in uh, which node a pod goes to. So the, the pod will always go to the, the node which has the highest proportion of its resources already allocated. Uh, and you can create any other scheduling policies just like this by enabling, disabling uh, from quite a large list of uh, scheduling plugins. Um, and you can change the, the weightings as well. Uh, so you could create other scheduling policies like this, but uh, uh, bin packing is kind of the most uh, obvious and uh, the easiest to, to define. And so to take a look at kind of what that does, 
I thought I'd make a, an illustration. I don't know if it really needs an illustration, but uh, it's been a while since I created any diagrams like this, so I thought it would be fun. Um, so let's say we have a three node cluster. We start like this, we have some system pods, these gray things, so like uh, this bottom row would be kind of uh, things that are created on every node, so like uh, storage interfaces, uh, network plugins, things like that. And then maybe on node one, we have some uh, like extra monitoring pods or something. So using the default scheduler, if we create a deployment with two replicas, uh, they would be kind of distributed across the nodes like this. Because these are the, the least used nodes, so this is where the pods would go. And you'd get kind of an even balance of, uh, of resources on, on each node. Uh, this is not great for the, the cluster autoscaler because uh, every node is being used, but every node is not being used much. There's a lot of uh, empty space here that uh, isn't doing much. So let's uh, get rid of that and then take a look at what would happen if we did the same thing, but using the, the bin packing policy. So in that case, both pods would go to, to this node one, which is uh, was already the, the most utilized of, uh, of all nodes. And they both go, both go here. And because we have multiple policies defined in the cluster, we can use both at once if we want. So we could then add this, uh, this deployment back. And so we'd have kind of this one deployment kind of scaling up on this node, and we'd have this deployment kind of scaling across the nodes like this. Uh, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but, but maybe you would. Um, and we can keep scaling up, uh, say this green deployment. We can add some uh, more pods and it will of course use the, the extra space on node one and then kind of spill over onto to one of the other nodes. Um, in this case, uh, it would just be kind of random, which is used because they were both uh, had the same amount of uh, resource utilization when the pod was created. So in this case, it goes on node two. But this is, uh, still a situation that is not great for the, the autoscaler because we have these orange pods here. So let's go and remove those again. And now we're back to a situation where we have this node three, which is uh, not being used and is uh, ready for the, the autoscaler to remove it. And even if we uh, keep scaling up the green deployment, it's going to keep putting on to, to node two and keep node three free so that it can be removed by the autoscaler. Um, and that's the, that's the end of my illustration. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed creating it. Um, and uh, that's just about what I have to say about uh, scheduling as well. Although I think there's probably some things I could say if you uh, ask some questions about it at the end. Um, so moving on to some other things that are in uh, 1.19, one interesting thing is that uh, Ingress has moved from being a, a beta API to, to a, a V1 API. Uh, and it's been in beta since about version 1.3, something like that. It's been a long time. And uh, there aren't too many changes in going from uh, V1 beta one to, to V1. Uh, there are some things you'll have to, to act on, but uh, nothing urgent because uh, V1 beta one will still be around until uh, Kubernetes 1.22 or 1.23, something like that. So you don't need to do anything yet, but eventually uh, you will need to. And uh, the major thing is that in, uh, in the beta, you define uh, an ingress with uh, this big thing. You probably recognize the spec rules, the HTTP paths, path, and then you give a, a backend, which defines the, which service the ingress connects to. And so in this, you give a, a service name and a service port. And in the, the V1 ingress, this changes slightly. So instead of backend, service name, service port, it's a backend and then service and then name port. And uh, port is defined like this with port and then number because you could give uh, 
uh, a port and a name if you uh, define named ports in the in the service. So just to, to look back again, it's going from service name, service port to service name port. So you will need to change that when you uh, when you move from uh, the beta ingress to, to v1, but everything else in the in the change should be uh, should be uh, smooth and won't need any uh, any extra input. It should all be backwards compatible with the with existing manifests. Um, so that's uh, that's ingress. And then one other thing is uh, immutable secrets and config maps. Uh, this is uh, well, there's a new field immutable true that you can add to uh, the definition of a, a secret or a config map. And that means that the, the secret or config map will be read only. You can't, uh, you can't edit it and you can't apply uh, another manifest over the top of it. Uh, you would have to delete it and recreate it to, to change the content. And the reason for this is it's not so much of a, a general feature, but it's uh, more about performance and scalability when you have, and it's only at the level of kind of uh, tens of thousands of, of secrets and, and config maps that this really makes a difference because it's uh, to do with, so when you, when you have uh, something in the cluster that is watching secrets and, and config maps, waiting for them to, to change and then kind of take some action on that, they have to be continuously checking with the API that uh, the secret or, or config map hasn't changed or, or if it has changed. So by marking them as immutable, it means that uh, this watch is no longer necessary and that frees up some of the load on the, the API server. Because you can, you know, you, once you've read the, the content of the, the secret once, you know it's not going to change. And this is, it's something you could use as a, a general feature if you created a, a secret and you know that the, the content isn't going to change and you want to ensure that you don't change it by accident, but it's probably not too necessary. And uh, lastly, uh, let's take a look at uh, kubectl debug, which is uh, it's still in alpha, so it's uh, under kubectl alpha debug. And uh, one thing you can do with it now is to debug nodes. So by running kubectl alpha debug node slash and the name of a node, and you can give it this image or any image, and it will, will create a pod with that image on this node, and the pod will be in the, in the host namespaces. So meaning that uh, say if you thought you had uh, a connectivity problem on the node, you could uh, create a, a pod like this, and you can say ping from that pod and the pod will be in the, the host networking namespace, which means that the ping is as if you were doing it from the node itself without any uh, container networking in between. And it's, so it's, it's kind of like SSHing to the, the node. I'd say it's not quite as, as useful, but I can see why there would be uses for it, especially if, uh, if you can't SSH to a node. And say, okay, say if uh, you forgot to add your key pair when creating a cluster, then this is one thing you could do and you can add the, uh, an SSH key onto the node because uh, when you do this, you get a, uh, a host path volume mount in the pod, which has the, the entire file system of the node under slash host. So you can just add the, the key that way. And you can also debug the pod by creating a duplicate of it. So when you do a debug in the name of a pod, you can say copy to, and it will create a, a copy of the pod with, with this name. And you give it an image again, and it uh, adds a new container with uh, this image in the pod. And it's, it's not like it uh, creates an exact copy of the, the pod state. It just creates a, a new, pod, but with the same definition as, as this original one. 
Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's kind of the highlights. There's not too many, but uh, you can go and read through the the release notes if you want to look for some smaller things. Uh, but I think these were the the, the interesting ones. So, if there are any questions? Uh, please uh, raise your hand, and uh, we'll see what we can do. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. I see already a question from Diogo. Um, well, first, thanks for the presentation. But I see uh, Diogo is asking if immutable true means that he wrote we can now write, but I think he means if we cannot write into the config map and secrets from inside the pod. Um, this uh, it does not have anything to do with uh, mounting them into pods. It just means whether the secret can be changed kind of via the, the Kubernetes API. So if you did, so it's kind of a, a guard against kubectl edit or kubectl apply that would, would change the content of the, the secret or config map. Okay, uh, well, I can actually also give him, I can give him voice so that he asks you. He says, uh, okay, but still not possible to edit from the pod. I, I can um, actually let him. No, if, if that's not possible now, uh, it, it, this won't change it. Diogo, if you, yeah, go ahead. I don't think we can hear him. No, I think he's saying something, but yeah. we can't hear. But yeah, I guess, I guess it's replied. So it's the same mechanism as before to mount the config map and secrets. It's just that they are immutable in the Kubernetes using the Kubernetes API. Yes. Okay. Let me check if there's another one. No, but I have a related one actually. So. Um, is there a change in the mechanism for uh, recreating a pod when you change a config map? Like you say you are assigning it before, there were some tricks you could do when you update a config map that the pod would be recreated. In this case, you will always, like you would need to change, the deployment would change basically, and this would recreate all the pods, is that it? Uh, well, there are definitely like, uh... Kind of third-party uh, projects for this, but yeah. no, I, I, that's still not part of uh, Kubernetes itself. Okay, if that's what you're asking. Yeah. Well, if there was some change, yeah. Nice. Okay, I have two questions on the scheduling policies. So you mentioned the uh, the way the policies are applied by the scheduler, but I guess this is done only at uh, scheduling time. So did you try, uh, there's something called the descheduler that basically makes sure that things are reorganized after the, the initial scheduling to match the policies. Uh, is this something that also works with this uh, uh, new scheduling policies? I'd have to look. I don't know if it, uh, if it just assumes that the, the default scheduler is being used or if it actually uh, has some way to, to know that a particular scheduling policy is being applied for a deployment or a pod and then to, to kind of simulate the kind of deschedule and reschedule with that, that policy. I'm not sure. Yeah, from what I remember, I think that the scheduler was basically replaying all the scheduling policies. So I guess it will just take them into account. Yeah, it would be interesting to follow up, I guess. And the second one was about, you described uh, in the scheduling policies that you had the slide, the initial one where you listed the different things you can enable, disable. All so, right. Uh, the one before, yeah, the, can, the one uh, after, I guess. This one. Yeah. On this page. No node resources list uh, located. Right. So how is this related to the predicate predicates and priorities that we could define before? Uh, okay, so, well, hang on, uh, predicates. predicates. You remember we could, yeah. Like, yeah. So 
yeah, there are uh, two stages. One where the scheduler filters out nodes that just cannot host the pod, either they don't have enough resources or there's something else that doesn't match, which is kind of the, the predicates. And then there's the priorities stage, which is on this. So on this page, it's called filter and, and score instead of uh, predicates and priorities. But it's, it's kind of the same thing. So the score is where the, the priorities are, are calculated. So it's kind of a, like a, an evolution of the old thing? I'm not sure. Let me search for predicate filter. These plugins are the equivalent of predicates in a scheduling policy. OK, and, and priority. OK, but yeah, it's, uh, it's about equivalent. OK, nice. I don't know if there are other questions, feel free to pop in. Otherwise you mentioned that you had a couple more things to say about scheduling. Uh, that's if I wanted to say about, uh, yeah. Because when you have this, uh, when you're scheduling like this and you have, wait, let me open this on the uh, full screen. When you're scheduling like this and you have everything packed onto the, the fewest number of nodes possible, that's it's good for the the scheduler, but uh, bad for for availability because you kind of uh, you know in, in this case rather than having kind of a, a spread across the nodes, you kind of put everything onto one node, and then if that one node uh, is going to fail, then you you've lost uh, both pods rather than just one. So if you wanted to create something that is both kind of uh, distributed for, for availability, but also using the, the, the bin packing scheduling, what you would want to do is use uh, multiple node groups kind of for, with one in, in each availability zone. So a node group A and node group B and a node group C. So that, that's kind of the basis of having the high availability. And then you would want to use the, uh, 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 pod topology spread constraints to ensure that you keep an even number of, of pods across each uh, node group because the that topology spread constraints is part of the, the filter part of the scheduling. So if you have say two pods on node group A, two on B and only one on C, then even if you have the, the bin packing scheduler, it will have to go to to the C node group, which has the fewest number of pods, because that's the only way to to keep the topology spread constraints uh, satisfied. And so, it, even if you had then if you had multiple node groups in if you had multiple nodes in the node group C, then it would use the 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 bin packing scheduler. But yeah, that that's what I wanted to say about that. Yeah, <coughs> makes sense. Yeah. Cool. I think we have a very clear use case for this bin packing when we were debugging uh, the experiment workloads where they have like one core and eight core jobs. So they have eight core nodes and like the bin packing is, is kind of important to make sure you always have nodes available for, for the eight core yes. jobs. Yes, yeah. You because want to stack up all of the, the one core pods together on a, a single node. Let me check if there are any more questions. Feel free to raise your hand. If like 20 more seconds. Otherwise, I think that's it. Thank you very much for the presentation, Thomas. And no problem. And yeah, we will have the 119 available in the next couple of days. So we can all play with this very, very soon. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you, everyone, for attending, and see you next time. Yep. Thanks for joining. Bye-bye.